Hello and welcome. I'm Lauren Gardner, a healthcare reporter at Politico, and I'm pleased to welcome uh, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, a Democrat from Illinois, to the Harvard Chan Studio. This conversation is part of a series called Public Health on the Brink, which explores the most urgent challenges facing public health as well as promising solutions. Congresswoman Underwood, we have a lot to discuss, so let's jump right into it. Thank you. Um, th thanks for being here. So I, I wanted to start with uh, gun violence. Uh, a couple of years ago, Congress appropriated money for research into gun violence as a public health issue for the first time in decades. So given the fatal racially motivated shooting in Buffalo last weekend, what more can and should lawmakers do, particularly now while both chambers are under Democratic control, you're a member of the Democratic Party, uh, what more can they do to, to address this issue? Well, you know, we've been successful and for the first time being able to appropriate funding for NIH and CDC in decades, as you mentioned, to study gun violence as a public health threat. However, um, we would like for more funding to be allocated. I'd like to see at least 50 million split between those two agencies or more. Um, we know that our gun violence prevention uh, bills that passed the House with broad support, like the Bipartisan Background Checks Act and the, um, the legislation that dealt with the Charleston, um, at, at the shooting at Mother Emanuel AME um, at, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, to close that loophole requiring the federal background checks to be completed before um, a federally fire federally licensed firearm dealer is able to sell a gun to a purchaser, um, that that needs to be complete. And so we've not seen the Senate move on those kind of like basic foundational bills. And then we have, you know, opportunities to advance legislation like the extreme risk protection orders, which we commonly call red flag laws, like we have in Illinois, which we know save lives, um, obviously an assault weapons ban. So there's a lot in the gun violence prevention vertical. You know, one of the things that I've been really struggling with is when I think about what happened in Buffalo, um, it, to me, it's not like just regular gun violence, right? This is, um, this is something more. This is like a lynching in mass. And, and, and so like, even when we call it like a hate crime, that is even almost like not in my mind, the right phrasing for what occurred. And I think, you know, we don't have the words for it yet and certainly not necessarily the legal framework for it yet. But I do think that the planning and broadcasting on social media is something that is a new and increasingly popular feature of these domestic terrorism episodes. Um, and I think that there is obviously more work that the Congress needs to do to really look at the role of these algorithms in um, promoting that type of content. Um, and you know, basically these companies profiting off of that type of content um, and certainly making sure that we have a legal framework to hold these actors accountable for the scope of the harm that they are inflicting on society. Um, we know that we do not currently have a legal framework to even address domestic terrorism in general, right? There's no domestic terrorism statute, um, for example. And so even if someone um, commits what is you know, broadly and universally described and condemned as an act of domestic terrorism, we don't have that charge available to us. Um, and so that's something that the Congress continues to struggle with, uh, just to be candid with you. So I'm not going to sit here today, Lauren, and suggest that um, more legislation is imminent. We did just pass the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act out of the House this week. Um, and that's really to give some resources for DOJ to be able to work on domestic terrorism issues, but it's not, you know, changing uh, the law necessarily. And so I think that, you know, we're going to continue to do that kind of work and hopefully build support within uh, the House and then later the Senate to make sure that we can protect communities who we know are terrified at this increasingly prevalent threat, right? It's not just towards Black people or Asian Americans who we've seen a, a significant rise in anti-AAPI hate crimes. Um, it's not just anti-Semitism and the targeting of mosques and synagogues and, and temples. Um, we have our Sikh friends across the country who have continued to um, feel uh, the, the hate. And, and I think that, you know, we have 
a real need to modernize our legal structure given the nature of the threat um, and the fact that you know our leading law enforcement officials have described this type of actor as the number one terrorist threat in our country, right? So we have some long-term work to do. So you're a registered nurse and you're a leader in the effort to address the shockingly high rate of deaths for black women during pregnancy mm -hmm. and childbirth. So I'd like to hear your assessment of the problem. What are we doing wrong on this issue? Why are we not able to adequately protect women of color during pregnancy and childbirth? Well, we know that the United States has for decades had a disparity among communities of color. Really, um, the data suggests that, you know, our nation's leading rates of maternal mortality are driven by disparities experienced by Black and Native birthing people. Uh, Native Americans, two times more likely to die. Black folks, four times, up to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications. And then for every death, we have 70, 70 near misses. And this has been happening for decades, right, in the face of, you know, widespread federal inaction. It's just in the last couple of years that we've seen, you know, an optional postpartum Medicaid expansion for the full year postpartum, for example, the advancement of our mommy bus as another example. Um, and so what are we doing wrong? I mean, we see a healthcare system that has systemic racism built in, and we have to be comfortable acknowledging that as a fact if we're going to begin to address some of the solutions. Um, you know, when we look at healthcare systems and institutions, you know, there's implicit bias where, you know, providers or staff may not realize that they're treating different patients differently. You know, they might not realize that they're less responsive uh, to complaints of pain or something being wrong or just needing attention or help uh, from certain uh, people of certain backgrounds uh, versus others. And then there's explicit bias, AKA racism. You know, people actually say, oh, you have a higher pain tolerance, right? Oh, you can take it. Um, like that kind of thing, which we know continues to happen within our healthcare system. The data has told us what the leading causes of maternal death are. And that has been very clear um, for a number of years, right? And so the, the studies that we're doing and investing in now um, are things to test different interventions, maybe predictive factors, but it's not like, hmm, why are moms dying in this country? We know that information and we have um, some rigorous structures to both investigate the maternal death through those morbidity and mortality review committees, and then also institutions like the perinatal quality collaboratives that work statewide with healthcare systems to um, improve their metrics um, you know, for those leading causes of maternal death. So I think that we as a nation know what to do. We just have to make the choice to invest in these interventions that uh, are going to be effective at saving lives or scale up the interventions that work. So no longer are they only happening in certain states or certain communities, but we have the opportunity to offer communities across the country who are battling the same problem uh, to be able to save mom's lives. So federally, what can be done to turn turn this around? You just mentioned, you know, there's disparities depending on the locality yes. on the state. So how can the federal government, from your perspective, intervene on this? So one of the things that we know is important to recognize, particularly for the disparity that uh, we see in Black birthing people, is that you know it happens regardless of income level, education level, whether or not you have health insurance. If you do everything right, you are still three to four times more likely to die or more than your white counterparts. And so um, that means that you know a mandatory postpartum Medicaid expansion is important, but it's not the singular intervention. We have to do more than just Medicaid, which is where our Black Maternal Health Mommy Bus Act comes in. 12 bills to comprehensively address every clinical and non-clinical driver of our nation's maternal health crisis. So everything from addressing social determinants like housing, transportation, nutrition, right? Mom's going hungry. Um, and then environmental factors that the data has told us influences uh, maternal and infant, uh, infant health outcomes. So things like extreme heat and air pollution, right? As determinants of health, addressing leading causes of death like behavioral health, mental health and addiction, um, which are like in my state of Illinois, um, the number one cause of maternal death in our state, uh, making sure that we are equitably making new interventions available. So telehealth and the new emerging technologies that are 
really um, being introduced to the market very rapidly, but aren't necessarily getting into the hands of our most vulnerable moms who stand to benefit from the most from these new interventions, right? Our legislation addresses all of that plus COVID, which we know has uh, really influenced um, an uptake in our nation, uptick in our nation's maternal mortality rate, um, and you know, further exacerbated some longstanding disparities. And so um, we know we have a lot of work to do. One of our mommy bus bills has already been signed into law, the Protecting Moms Who Serve Act, which is uh, the legislation dealing with our veterans community. Um, another bill, the Maternal Vaccination Act, passed the House with unanimous bipartisan support, which like never happens. <laughs> so we're excited about that one. And then 80% of the rest was included in Build Back Better, that reconciliation package that passed the House at the end of 21. And it's still in the mix for whatever gets negotiated in the Senate as we move forward. All right, well, as you well know, the Supreme Court appears poised to overturn Roe v. Wade, which would enable states to completely ban abortion. You called the draft decision, quote, gut-wrenching, and said it could destabilize the economic, educational, and societal gains women have made in the last 50 years. But Democrats don't have the votes to codify abortion rights into law. So what do you think the healthcare landscape will look like for women in a few months? Well, within a few months, we've already seen, you know, several states take action. I think just today, so we're filming this on May 19th, Oklahoma, they're uh, the latest state to um, codify a complete abortion ban into law. And so now we are anticipating that there will not be a legal framework to challenge that under the Roe v. Wade precedent, right? That is extremely harmful for birthing people, pregnant people in Oklahoma who are seeking health care. Um, and so what we're going to see is that there will be a um, flurry probably of state activity to restrict um, the health care that's available to people. And then there's going to be some states like ours in Illinois that will continue to offer the full range of reproductive health care. And um, we are anticipating that there will be a lot of demand from people who will be traveling or um, desperate for care. Um, we know that the number of people seeking abortion care will not decrease, that abortion care will not go away in this country, but it will be criminalized. They want to put women in jail. They want to put women in jail. They want to control and then put women in jail. And that is so harmful for people who are seeking safe health care in this country. And so we will not be deterred. I think that the... Um, the vote count is what it is right now in the Senate, um, but there are some intermediate actions that I think um, and I hope that the Biden administration is preparing to take in order to protect um, existing rights. Um, things like interstate travel, right, which we have the ability to do as the American people, um, and then to make sure that they are clearly communicating um, that things like medication abortion remain safe um, in the face of misinformation, which we know rapidly spreads online, just as two examples of executive actions that could be taken that I certainly hope will be taken um, as we look ahead to you know, the Supreme Court decision that we know will be coming in a matter of weeks. Some on the left have voiced fears that this Supreme Court could overturn other rights, such as same-sex same marriage or even the right to contraception. Do you share those concerns? Well, I think that the leaked opinion opened the door to um, give a glimpse at least of what Justice Alito was thinking. And I think that the American people should be concerned with legal precedent that we thought had long been determined, whether it's, you know, love, uh, loving, the loving case, um, whether it's uh, the right to same sex marriage, whether it's Brown v. Board of Education. I think that we have a very um, activist court that is um, set to roll back rights and protections of the American people. It's a uh, dangerous and scary environment. Um, and, you know, we should enter into this phase eyes wide open um, and prepare to do all that we can as citizens to protect our rights and our democracy. 
I want to move on to pandemic preparedness. This has been a front of mind issue for me as a reporter covering FDA over the last year. Before coming to Congress, you worked as a senior advisor to the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, and part of your role was to help local communities prepare for and respond to health emergencies, ranging from bioterror attacks to disease outbreaks. So based on what you saw then and what you've seen over the last two and a half years of our national response to COVID-19, how prepared are we for the next big crisis? Well, we certainly learned a lot over the COVID pandemic. Obviously, the pandemic is not over um, and that we have seen the emergence of new variants. Um, and, you know, because of, you know, some congressional inaction on a COVID supplemental, right, our nation may not be prepared to broadly deploy any kind of new vaccines, new therapeutics, or even vaccines for our babies, right, those infants to five-year-olds that might become uh, approved by the FDA over the next period of time, right? And so that definitely impacts our nation's preparedness, 100%. And so we have to be very clear-eyed about the nature of the upcoming threats, even with COVID. Now, when we look ahead to future pandemics, you know, emerging infectious diseases that have pandemic potential, right? One of the things that I really learned during my time at the Department of Health and Human Services is how important it is to create plans, right? To exercise those plans and then to follow the plan that you exercise upon the uh, emergence of a new viral agent, right? A new vaccine, you know, what a, a new infectious agent. And so um, that did not happen in the early days of 2020 under the Trump administration. Um, I think that that you know unwillingness to use those. Um, well thought out and exercise plans, coupled with um, some real vulnerabilities that we had in our supply chains um, are two just examples of things that have been fixed, right, under this administration after, you know, two years of a pandemic posture. Um, I think that we also have made some really key investments through large scale um, COVID relief packages like the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan that will bolster our public health infrastructure. And so while our public health workers have largely been, you know, really beat up on over the course of the pandemic, um, we have uh, made key investments to really strengthen that infrastructure across the country. So we have better surveillance we have better use of technology, right? Like the fact that we're talking about wastewater surveillance, right? To see what, what strains of COVID are now dominant is an, an innovation that's happened during the course of the pandemic. And that will help us for future diseases to come. Um, and so I think that that's a real bright spot. Um, you know, I support for fiscal year 23, the president's budget request for four and a half billion dollars for a global health security and pandemic preparedness fund, recognizing how interdependent we are across the world on one another um, to more quickly react and respond to contain, um, you know, emerging, infectious diseases and um, to help one another because we really do have uh, shared interests, priorities, and you know, we're, we're, in it, we're really in it together. And so we have to be able to make the investments in order to sustain that kind of global posture. Besides the ongoing debate in Congress over uh, an additional $22 billion in funding for COVID response, so besides, besides the funding question, where do you think deficits continue in terms of the US government's ability to both respond to the ongoing pandemic and also be prepared for the future? Well, I think that the public has largely viewed COVID as a partisan issue at this point in time. Um, and so, you know, when we think of, even in the context of like the midterm elections, the COVID-19 pandemic is listed as, you know, an item that people can respond to in a partisan way, like they do the economy or like they do immigration or like they do healthcare, right? And that's really dangerous because um, we should be in a place where people are able to hear the best advice from our nation's leading scientists and then respond to it like they would hear advice from their own healthcare provider, right? And right now, every piece of COVID advice or information is viewed in a partisan lens where half the country believes that the pandemic is over and COVID was a nightmare that they are so anxious to put behind them. And it's just dangerous because, you know, we haven't um, reached a point yet where 
we are no longer vulnerable to this virus. Um, and so what more can we do? I think that we need to continue to identify and deploy messengers who can be trusted voices to reach all Americans so that they are at least getting the healthcare information that they need to make a decision about keeping themselves and their families and their community safe. Um, I think that we um, have seen a shift where folks are only talking to the people that want to hear from them. And that's kind of a dangerous, in my opinion, position to be in, um, recognizing the nature of this continuing evolving threat because of the emerging variants and the very high case rates that we're seeing around the country right now. I mean, extremely high. Um, and, and that's a tough place to be. I want to move on to mental health. You recently held a town hall with students in your district to talk about the mental health crisis among young people. And the CDC recently reported that more than four in 10 teens feel, quote, persistently, persistently sad or hopeless, and uh, more than 20% have considered suicide. So what did you hear from teens during this town hall? And, you know, what, in the moment, what did you feel you could offer them? Yeah, so in my congressional district, you know, we've really seen an increase in, you know, acute mental health crises. Um, we like every school district in my congressional district has had a suicide attempt or a suicide completion this school year. Some school districts have had multiple, some high schools have had multiple. And so I visited a high school that had had multiple uh, suicides in this academic year. And the Surgeon General came and engaged some students who had been really active in that um, in that space, right, helping their student community navigate this environment. You know, I heard a lot from those students. Some were talking about the stigma and the fear in talking about, um, you know, what's going on with themselves, but also their classmates with their parents, right, for fear that there might be some negative reaction. Some talked about the lack of resources in their community, feeling like that there was nowhere for them to go for help or for assistance um, or to get care and treatment. Um, and then, you know, some were really talking about, you know, the, the lack of resources within the school, right? So, you know, in our community, at least after a traumatic event, the school district might surge in um, some, you know, trauma counselors for like a day or two, literally, and then those folks leave. And then when everybody crashes a week or two later, like it hits them that their friends really aren't coming back, there's not that same kind of resource available. And so I was sharing with those students that we had successfully secured a 700% increase for school-based mental health support in that fiscal year 22 uh, funding package that was signed into law in March. Um, and that, you know, school districts like ours in Northern Illinois could compete for those dollars to bring additional resources. And I think that they, the students really appreciated the candor that we had a safe space to have this conversation, um, that we were even interested in hearing from them, but also like the type of action that the Congress could take, right? It's not just, um, you know, people worried about things that aren't relevant to them, right? It made it um, much more um, uh, practical and, and relevant to them. And I, um, I think that, you know, we're gonna continue that dialogue and it's gonna be uh, very constructive as we move ahead, talking about how to have more providers, right, in our community, how to break down, you know, barriers for people getting into a clinic, whether it's reimbursement related or, you know, um, out-of-pocket costs related or whatever, right? We just need to have a system where um, people can go see a mental health counselor, like we have massage envies in our suburban strip malls, right? And so what are all those key barriers from preventing us from having that kind of a healthcare system? That's where I want to, that's the kind of conversation I want to have. Looking ahead to the uh, appropriation season that we're in now, do you expect mm -hmm. to be able to build upon uh, that legislation that was just signed into law with, uh, with colleagues across the aisle as well? I think so, because I think that our experience in Northern Illinois is not unique. You know, what we see is this mental health crisis that our young people are facing. And I use that phrase intentionally to mirror what the Surgeon General said. Um, we're seeing it manifest in higher suicide rates. We're seeing it in what I would call like the accidental overdose, right? People thinking that they're going on social media to try to get, um, you know, a pill and they end up getting a fentanyl lace pill and dying, right? It, it, that to me is reflecting the high levels of depression and anxiety um, and just dismay in this population of people. Um, and some, some people might 
cope through drug abuse. Some people cope through self-harm, right? But it's symptoms, in my opinion, of the same issue. Um, and I think that everyone is seeing it. And so it's up to us as leaders to step up and to meet that need and meet that challenge and resource it appropriately. You know, there's a lot of bipartisan interest around um, opioids, which is well-founded, um, and including on the treatment side, which is great. Um, but I do think that when we talk about our young people, we have to talk about the workforce needs for child and adolescent psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, counselors, social workers. But then also we have to talk about um, what's going on in the community, the number of inpatient beds, how we make sure that those um, in our rural healthcare systems, that our mental health providers can maintain their businesses so they can stay open and continue to offer this life-saving care. That's the kind of thing that I think uh, we have support for on both sides of the aisle, and I would like to see advance through the Congress. So you're the youngest Black woman to serve in the House. I am. Mm -hmm. Like me, you're a millennial named Lauren. Yes. So, <laughs> so I'm curious, what surprised you the most when you got to Congress in 2019? Okay, 2019, so this is pre-COVID, right? We, we were not Zooming every day. Nothing happened on the internet. So, you know, I didn't have the email addresses from my colleagues or my committee chairman. They were giving us so much paper, Lauren. Like I had to learn how to file in these filing <laughs> cabinets that were in my office. And like, no one taught me how to do that, set up a filing system, what? Um, and so that came as a big surprise. Um, and, you know, that feels like a small thing, but when we came up, you know, where email is the primary way that you communicate, and now we have like texting and signal and like all these different things, for everything in Congress to operate off of face-to-face -face conversation, it just lets you know that when they say, oh, you know, Washington's dysfunctional, like, wow, you have to have some adaptive or maybe maladaptive behaviors to be able to thrive in this kind of an environment, um, to be able to get things done. And, you know, how much relationships truly do matter because those kind of shortcuts and the communication shortcuts just aren't there. Um, and so it was interesting. Um, it, yeah, it, it, definitely an adjustment from working in healthcare, definitely adjustment from working in public health, um, but we've found our way through, which has been fun. Have you been able, over the course of your time in Congress thus far, have you been able to share any uh, specific perspectives or, or insights with colleagues that may have opened up uh, someone's mind on a certain issue that you maybe weren't expecting? Well, what I do is I share my story and, you know, I've been very clear that I bring my full self to my work. And so, you know, one of the things that I found to be true is when I got sworn in in 2019, you know, we were the most diverse Congress in American history. We dropped the average age of the Congress by like 10 years. And I came in with some big personalities, some superstars. And so for me to be effective, I had to quickly develop relationships and be clear about what I wanted to accomplish, right? So all my colleagues knew that like Lauren's the nurse and she wants to work on healthcare and to be collaborative. And, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of people are one, not here to be legislators and that's fine because um, there's different roles for people to play, but I had to be very clear and explicit about what I wanted to accomplish if I were going to have hopes to get things done. And I think that that clarity of purpose and being willing to articulate it over and over and over, even among colleagues, has been something that I think most people just don't do as directly. Um, and so that might be more of a tactical thing, um, but I would just say, you know, I think a lot of new and young people in workplaces that might be intimidating may be less willing to be as direct about their own goals and objectives. But for me, I didn't have the luxury of waiting. I have a two-year term and my community expected me to deliver for them across multiple topics in that two-year term. And so we couldn't be shy or coy, you know, or anything like that. You just have to be direct and let folks know and, and draw on the power of those personal stories to build connections uh, with people in an intergenerational workplace. That's the other thing. You know, my colleagues, I have colleagues who are like in their 80s and, you know, or older and learning how to work in an environment that is truly intergenerational in every sense of the word is something that I had not had a professional experience. 
like that before. Um, and so, you know, it's definitely a learning curve, but now it's been pretty fun. And I really appreciate hearing those different perspectives. All right, last question. Yes, sir. 30 seconds. You've okay. spent a lot of time working on a wide range of public health issues. What is your, in your view, the single biggest obstacle to improving health and healthcare in the United States? The single biggest obstacle is that um, people think that um, you have to be deserving of healthcare and this framework of certain people deserve something and others do not. So, and if you get sick, you deserved it versus, um, you know, healthcare being a human right is the biggest obstacle to fully funding and uh, fully resourcing our public health and healthcare systems in this country. All right. Thank you, Congresswoman, for taking the time. This was really great. Appreciate you joining <laughs> Thank us. Thank you.